One of the most exciting time periods in the 3D acceleration industry was the year 1999. The most exciting release, the GeForce 256, I've already covered extensively. But that card came out towards the tail end of the year, and so for the bulk of 1999, the field was covered by a different set of products from a pair of companies at the near peak of their game. They were NVIDIA's TNT2 Ultra and 3FX's Voodoo 3 3500, and with them came one of the most contentious rivalries of the pre-millennia. This is Pixel Pipes. Let's set the stage for a moment. Something many may remember from the year 1999, at least in the PC world, was the sheer amount of rampant competitiveness that took place. Not just amongst graphics cards, but CPUs, game developers, and even amongst gamers. The year was just full of hotly contested rivalries. Take the two most popular games of the year, for example, Unreal Tournament and Quake 3. The two developers that made them, Epic Games and id Software, were competing for who had the best engine technology at the time, and their games were vying for the exact same market. Online competitive multiplayer was rising fast in popularity, bolstered by the onset of broadband, and when gamers weren't competing online, they could be found hitching up their sleeves and lugging their beige monoliths and bulging CRTs to LAN party events, something you don't see much of today, but which gave PC gamers the chance to show off their pimped out rig and snap an ethernet cable in for some high speed locally networked matches. <laughs> Then there were the graphics cards. With the Riva TNT series in 1998, Nvidia had come a long way towards earning a foothold amongst gamers and system builders, but they were merely chipping away at the fortress that 3DFX built, with their king product the Voodoo 2. The foundation was there for a usurper, however, and Nvidia's twin Texel architecture just needed a few tweaks before it would be ready for a shot at the throne. And that moment would come the following year. Launched on the 15th of March 1999, the TNT2 Ultra and TNT2 series in general is mostly a feature update of the NV4 based Riva TNT, with larger 2048 by 2048 texture resolution support, an upgrade to full 32 bit Z buffer and stencil support, 1.5 volt AGP support, and larger 32 megabyte VRAM support. Based on the NV5 core, the bulk of the performance improvements come from a bump in core clock to 150 MHz, thanks to a drop in manufacturing process from 350 to 250 nanometer, a pretty large improvement over the 90 MHz of the previous generation. Otherwise, it still uses the same twin Texel architecture of its forebear, meaning it has dual pixel pipelines with one texture unit in each. The memory comes clocked at a baseline of 183 MHz over the 128-bit bus. I say baseline because Nvidia's policy surrounding board partner cards was quite unique for its time. In what would be a first for the company, they actually encouraged the release of overclocked variants, perhaps in order to replicate the wide variety of Voodoo 2s that had released over the previous year. Somewhat ironically, the Voodoo 2 successor that would be the TNT2 Ultra's main competition would not see the same variation. That was because in late 1998, 3DFX would change their product distribution strategy entirely, and somewhat controversially with the acquisition of STB Systems, a respected card manufacturer of the time. Through the use of their facilities, 3DFX would produce all their own products in-house, pitting their own production against other board makers that had once been valuable partners. As a result, most board partners shunned 3DFX's Voodoo 3 and later series products, and very few models besides 3DFX's own were ever made. This meant no overclocked variants, and all cards in the line, including the Voodoo 3 3500, would only be seen at their stock specifications. Codenamed Avenger, the 3500's core ran at 183 MHz, a decent amount higher than the TNT2 Ultra's base core spec, except that it retained the single pixel pipe configuration of the Voodoo 2 line, including the dual texture units. While the two TMUs could, in theory, match the maximum texture fill rate of the TNT2, this was only in games that used multi-texturing effects. The TNT2 could utilize both of its TMUs regardless of the situation, and could draw almost twice as many pixels as the Voodoo 3. The memory of the 3500 was clocked at 183 MHz, like the TNT2 Ultra, giving equivalent bandwidth between the two, but with a maximum frame buffer limited to 16 MB. 
Of course, the limited memory size didn't matter as much since the Voodoo 3 didn't come close to matching the graphical features of the TNT 2. It was still stuck on a decidedly dated 256 by 256 maximum texture resolution and could not render in 32-bit color mode, something even Nvidia's first Riva TNT could do. 3DFX believed that performance was all that truly mattered to gamers, not features or image quality, a philosophy they would flip completely upside down with the very next generation when performance was no longer their strong suit. 3D effects nonetheless did tweak their dithering algorithm to minimize the appearance of pixelated colors while running 16-bit rendering. They called this 22-bit rendering, which was more marketing term than anything else, and because it worked using the RAM DAC, it only affected the final output image through VGA, something you wouldn't see in screenshots captured from the frame buffer. To my eyes, the dithering pattern does seem a bit less noticeable on the Voodoo 3 versus 16-bit on the TNT 2, but of course if image quality is your top concern, the TNT 2 supports 32-bit color, albeit with a considerable performance hit. One of the more bizarre quirks with regards to the Voodoo 3 3500 in particular was 3FX's decision to release the card to retail with a TV and FM tuner on board. In fact, the card doesn't even have a standard VGA output, relying on a large, cumbersome breakout box that plugs in via a specialized connector on the card, giving you both VGA output as well as a set of input and output composite and S-Video ports. In every other regard, the V3 series was touted as speed over features, but nonetheless, 3DFX felt that potential buyers may choose the Voodoo 3 3500 TV, as it was known, as their all-in-one media solution. While it was no doubt novel for those that owned one, I can't help but wonder why they didn't make a lower cost version without the dongle and all the media features. Well, actually that's what you've been looking at this whole time in this b-roll footage. This is in fact a Voodoo 3 3500 without a TV tuner, obviously, replaced with a normal set of VGA and TV outputs on the back. The only problem was this wasn't made available as a standalone product to consumers. 3DFX built this version specifically for Compaq for use in their gaming desktops, and they're an especially rare 3500 variant, but with some much welcome added convenience and actual use. My TNT2 Ultra comes from Creative Labs, and though not nearly as interesting as my Voodoo 3, is clocked at the baseline frequency specified by NVIDIA, which I prefer for benchmarking. I don't want to give results with overclocked cards, even if they're set by the manufacturer, as they don't represent the average experience or stock capabilities intended by the chip designer. <laughs> With that said, I think now is a good time to move on to the test results. Here at Pixel Pipes, we intentionally use overpowered CPUs and newer, but not always the newest drivers, which are more mature and perform better than what was available at the time of launch, in order to get as close to each graphics card's true potential performance as possible. Please check the video description for test system details. In our first test, we see the TNT2 Ultra take a commanding lead right out of the gate, scoring 1,453 more points, or just over 19% faster than the Voodoo 3 3500. Then again, this isn't a very demanding test for these cards. 3D Mark 2000, however, gives them more of a strain, and the scores here are within margin of error with each other. So far, this match is proving to be unpredictable. Things turn around in our first OpenGL test though, again not a very demanding game but an impressive showing from the Voodoo 3 at over 33% faster than the TNT2 Ultra. Quake 3 turns up the heat a bit, being one of the most demanding games of 1999. The TNT2 Ultra gives just playable performance, handing the edge over to the Voodoo 3 which gets a 24% higher frame rate this time. Unreal, though a year older and running on a very different engine, shows very similar results to Quake 3. The Voodoo 3 once again scores about 24% higher than the TNT 2 here. Regardless of how it started, it's no longer looking too favorable for the Nvidia card. Unreal Tournament is surprisingly less strenuous than Unreal, despite releasing a year later on the same engine. But that's mainly due to the benchmark in Unreal pulling off many more effects than the title screen demo for Unreal Tournament. Here the Voodoo 3 only gets about 14% better results. The pendulum swings back to the TNT 2 in Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, with a comfortable lead of over 18% above the Voodoo 3. The race tightens up again in our next uh, racing game, but the TNT 2 Ultra still takes first place with 12% faster results. 
then like Whiplash, we have a huge win for the Voodoo 3 3500 in Expendable, crushing the TNT2 Ultra by around 49%, making a huge difference to the play experience of this game. And then to wrap it all up, I thought I'd go ahead and average the scores between the 7 games tested, leaving out the 3D Mark series. Though they traded blows in many places, the Voodoo 3 took the overall crown, with an average frame rate 15.5% higher than the TNT2 Ultra. A solid win for 3DFX's champ. I had a brief look at some reviews from back in 1999, and it seems like at the time the TNT2 Ultra was generally seen as the winner with the Voodoo 3 3500 only taking a few of the open jail tests. But well honestly most reviews at that time kind of sucked. I mean they were extremely limited with one or two 3D Mark tests, a couple of maps of Quake 3, some Quake 2 if you were lucky, and maybe Unreal Tournament. That's really not enough. They were also testing with a Pentium 3 at 600 megahertz at best, which is why it's all the more important that I do what I do. Well, maybe not super important to modern folks. I mean, no one's shopping for a graphics card from 1999 that they can put in their Ryzen system for some Cyberpunk 2077 action, but maybe from a historical standpoint, having a more accurate record of what these cards could actually do can help us better understand the past, maybe even more than we did when the past was present. And with the benefit of hindsight and more CPU performance than was available then, it's pretty clear, to me at least, that the Voodoo 3 3500 had no equal in 1999, at least when NVIDIA's best offering was the TNT2 Ultra. Of course, this depended entirely on whether you valued speed above all else, as there were definitely instances where the TNT2 Ultra would give you sharper, higher res textures, and when enough performance headroom allowed, higher color depth. Though I don't think many in 1999 honestly cared that much about the latter, having been used to 16-bit color for a few years by then. For those wanting to collect these cards today, prices aren't cheap, and the laws of supply and demand simply don't apply in this case, especially with 3DFX cards. Or perhaps more accurately, demand for 3DFX hardware is always so high that prices continually rise regardless of supply. The Voodoo 3 3500 isn't very common, even in its retail TV form. But the 3000 model is abundant and only slightly slower, and as of 2020 can be had at or slightly under $100 with a bit of patience. The TNT2 Ultra is even less common, but a basic model can be purchased for far cheaper when you can find one. The industry was a tumultuous place at the turn of the millennium, but for a brief moment 3DFX still held the crown, at least for one last time. That whole period, for the people that lived it, will always be one they look back on fondly. A, a turning point for PC gaming, the apex of competition from technology companies in both the hardware and software realms, and the enduring memories that they created that still live on today. Will there ever be anything like it again? Well, I sure hope so. Thanks for watching. I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes.